Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are. And uh, welcome to the webinar. Um, so this is How to Taste Wine. Um, so this will be the for the WSET Level 3 course. So we're doing it the Level 3 way. So um, I'll talk about that in just a moment. Before I do, just a little bit about WSET for those of you who are less familiar. So um, the Wine and Spirit Education Trust. We're the world's leading provider of qualifications and courses in wines, spirit and sake. WSCC has over 50 years experience in designing and delivering education to help both wine spirits, um, to help both wine professionals and consumer enthusiasts learn more about wine, spirits and sake, and of course professionals in those fields as well. So you can take these qualifications in over 70 countries, so I'm sure we have a few of you from um, other countries around the world. And we've got more than 800 course providers um, you can take these, some of these qualifications um, in 15 different languages, including Spanish and Chinese. So, of course, if you're interested in finding more about any of this, um, then um, you can find more information at our website. So that's wsetglobal.com. And so you'll be able to see where your nearest providers are. So this session today, this webinar today will be recorded. It will be available to watch by the WSCT Global Events Hub on YouTube. So as I go through this session today, please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box. <coughs> Excuse me. We will try and cover as many as we can at the end um, as, as possible. So my name is Lauren Denyer, as you can see. Um, the letters dip WSCC when I completed my diploma, which was quite a while ago. I'm an educator. So one of the reasons I'm doing this um, webinar today is because I work at an APP, an approved programme provider for WSET qualifications, and I teach the wine qualifications, and I teach levels one, two, three, and the diploma. So I'm quite well versed in what the differences are between the different qualifications. Um, I've been doing it for almost six years now, and so the aim of today's webinar is to go through and have a look at what you may have learned at level two, if you did indeed do level two, which I suspect that most of you will have done, which is why you're here today, and then how that differs at level three. And we'll be focusing mainly on the tasting elements for that. So first of all, so I'm going to go through this slide. Um, I'll probably take 30 to 40 minutes going through this. As we go through, please feel free to post any of your questions. Um, and of course, we have a chat box there as well. So if you want to chat to each other as we go through, but I won't be able to stop and chat with you during, during this webinar. So any questions, please make sure they go into the Q&A area. So let's have a little look about what it consists of for the level three award in wines. So what are you gonna learn? Well, you are going to be, it's gonna be split, split into two units, unit one and unit two. So unit one is really focusing on the theory side of things. So the th we've got the key factors in the production of wine. So some of this, <coughs> excuse me, um, will be familiar. So you've got the location um, of, of where the wine regions are, the grape growing, wine making, maturation, which we haven't really done in too much detail at level two. So there's a bit more emphasis on that um, and bottling. OK, now how these key factors, so we've seen the key factors there, but how these key factors influence the key characteristics of the principal still wines of the world. OK, um, and the principal sparkling wines of the world and the principal fortified wines of the world. So now there's a lot more linking. OK, so you have to think about what's going on in the vineyard, in the winery, potentially what's happening once the bottle has been gone onto the market and then how all of those things actually will contribute to the the style um, and the quality of those wines. Um, now we talk about style and quality to a, to a point at level two but we there's much more emphasis on it at level three and then you're going to be able to apply that understanding to explain those things. So a lot of explanation, a lot of linking. So it's not just factual knowledge. So if you think back to when you did level two or maybe level one, you will have learned a lot You'll have gained a lot of information, but when you are assessed, you will have just had a choice of, of an answer um, from, from a question. So a choice of, of four potential answers. So you didn't really have to make any real links. You just had to remember um, what happens where, for example. So unit two, that is, um, that's our tasting element. So, oh, thank you for the thumbs up there. So that's how you're gonna taste the wines. Now, 
we'll, I'm going to show you the different SATs. So those of you that have done level two, you'll be familiar with the level two SAT already, but we'll have a quick look at that again. And then we'll have a look at the level three SAT and look at the differences. Um, we'll look at what we kind of expected to um, think about a bit more at level three, particularly for tasting. And then I'm going to go through a couple of SATs with you that are level two SATs and see how they would translate if they were the same wines being shown in a level three class and how we would therefore assess them in that way. So now we are, again, we're describing the characteristics. So we're picking up the characteristics, the aromas, the flavors. We're thinking about the quality as you do at level two, but this time we're doing it with a level three systematic approach to tasting wine. And this time we are going, there's more options and that's what we're gonna explore. And there's a little bit more thinking and linking happening. So at level one, like I said before, this is knowledge. It's purely knowledge that you pick up from the, <coughs> excuse me, I've had a bit of a, a bit of a chest infection, but I'm fine now. So, <coughs> um, so you have to link the words to sensations. Okay, so if you're smelling something, you'll describe what it is that you're smelling. And you've got a few things to think about there, what you're tasting, maybe thinking a little bit about, you know, how does the acid feel? Um, are there tannins? If so, you know, how high might they be? But, you know, it's just kind of feeling and noting down some of those observations. And of course, there's no assessment. So um, no, no assessment for tasting. There's an assessment for theory, but no assessment for tasting. So level two, you've got that knowledge. You're doing a bit of understanding here now. So you're thinking, OK, well, cool climate. Um, we've got higher acidity and you'll have an idea of why that is. And you'll get questions about that um, in the in the theory. And in the tasting, you'll be thinking about that a little bit more. You'll be thinking, OK, when I'm tasting this wine, rather than what it tastes like, a little bit, why does it taste like that? OK, so what makes the wine unique? Why is this a, um, a Rioja rather than, you know, a wine from, um, you know, Australia, let's say, for example. But again, we're still just picking up some of the fundamentals. We're not going in, we're not being too nuanced. And again, the tasting is not assessed. Now, when we get to level three, we are not just knowledge and understanding, but also explanation. So a lot more linking, as I've mentioned before. So, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. So we have to add detail to effectively understand the arguments for quality and aging potential. So we're not just saying, oh, this is, um, this is an outstanding wine. We're saying why it's an outstanding wine, or if this is an acceptable wine, but why is it acceptable? And there's elements of that at level two, but you can go into more detail at level three. And of course, you're going to need to because now you're going to be assessed when you do your exam for level three. So for level three exam, you've got a theory part, which consists of um, some multiple choice questions. But you've also got open response, short answer questions. So you have to actually write down um, your answers here in some paragraphs, sentence and paragraphs. And then um, one part of your exam will be a tasting element where you taste two wines. You've got a white wine and a red wine. So the first wine will always be white. The second one will always be red, but you won't be assessed tasting wise for fortified, for um, sparkling wine or for rosé wine. So, you know, there's there's a, there's a few wines though, therefore, that could get into the into the exam there. So what we're talking about now is how good the wine is. So definitely focusing on quality, much more of a focus on quality. But we're also now going to think about maturation in bottle. So how is it going to age? Is it suitable for aging? If it is we can think about why. If it isn't, we can think a little bit about why. <coughs> a bit of a frog in my throat there. So anyway, um, right. So if we have a look at our SAT, I'm going to go through this very quickly because you should generally be quite familiar with the level two SAT if you've already um, done your SAT, done your level two. So we can see we've got an emphasis on appearance, intensity and colour. OK, now that isn't going to be too different when we look at the um, level three SAT. Um, we've got intensity on the nose. So again, um, what one so one mark for well, one one thing to think about would be the intensity. And then we've got a few. We'd like to be picking up maybe a few aroma characteristics and we can think about whether they belong in primary. So primary being um, really the characteristics that you're going to get from from the grape. And we can talk about that a little bit more. Secondary, these are the things that happen for winemaking. So there's a few winemaking choices that can be thought about there. And tertiary will usually refer to what happens after the winemaking, but sometimes can overlap a little bit. So I'll go into more detail in a moment when we look at our level three SATs. 
Then we've got on the palate. So again, not much changes actually. So we've got the sweetness, acidity, tannins, alcohol, body, uh, flavor intensity, and some flavor characteristics that we encourage to think about, um, and then our finish. And then we're left with our quality conclusion. So poor, acceptable, good, very good, or outstanding. So fairly straightforward. We've got on the other side, this comes as a card, um, and you'll see it in the book as well. On the other side, you'll have the lexicon. So you've got a range of flavors and aromas, not confined to um, this, but this is very helpful. And generally I, I would stick to this. So you've got them split up in primary, secondary, and tertiary. That will be familiar because you only start getting like a full card and SAT at level two. Um, so you, you have a lot of descriptors there that you can come and pick from. So primary aromas and flavors, you've got all the way from floral notes through to um, spicy notes with some fruit characteristics in between. So green fruit, citrus fruit, stone fruit, tropical fruit, things we'd associate with white wine, red fruit, black fruit, things we'd associate with um, red wine and potentially some rosé. Um, and then we've got fruit ripeness there that we can also remark upon and any other. And of course, you know, we might find as well that some wines you get certain characteristics that aren't on the SAT, but maybe they're useful as well to, uh, to help describe the wine. And we've got our secondary aromas and flavours. So there's a little hint here, particularly in yeast, as to where those, um, those flavours and aromas come from, because the lees, autolysis and floor, but we're not encouraged too much to make those links. It's literally, what am I smelling in the glass? Okay, I'm smelling something a little bit bready. Write it down, okay? Now at level three, we won't just write it down. We'll really think about where that comes from and why. So you've got yeast, got malolactic conversion, and we've got oak there as well for secondary. So those are winemaking choices. A winemaker can choose whether they're going to, um, you know, have yeast um, one way or another. Um, as, as a wine making choice during making the wine. So if there's going to be lees, if it's going to be floor, like for sherry or autolysis, like for traditional methods of bubbling wines, malolactic conversion, again, a white wine choice um, and oak, of course, whether you're going to keep your wine in, in oak um, and uh, we'll discuss that a little bit later. So tertiary aromas and flavours, we're thinking about the development of the wine. So um, here, red wine, what happens when a red wine's left in bottle, white wine, what happens when a white wine's left in bottle, and deliberately oxidised wines as well, which tends to prefer more to fortified wines. OK, but you can see they're not really explaining how those happen. They're just like, oh, that happens afterwards. So we at level two, we go, that's what happens afterwards, or maybe for fortified wine during, but we're not really going to explore that that much, whereas at level three, we'll find that we do a bit more. OK, so tasting, what has changed from level two? So now when you're tasting at level three, you're going to be assigning marks. Okay, so you're going to be thinking about it a little bit more. But, uh, well, when I write down these aromas and flavours, how many marks am I getting? Because, of course, you're assessed at the end of it. So I'll show you a breakdown of where you pick up your marks for level three. Um, there are much. Well, I say there are many more options. There are quite a few more options to pick from. So you are going to need to be a little bit more specific. OK, so we've got three point scales. So, you know, light, medium and full. But now these get expanded into five point scales. And I'll talk about how to approach those. You do need to remark on the development of the wine. So when you're smelling the wine, you need to think to yourself, OK, is this youthful? Is it developing? And we'll discuss about that in a moment. Um, there are more flavour and aroma descriptors. So the lexicon is bigger. It takes up a lot more space um, and you're very much encouraged to use more aromas and flavors and of course again be a bit more specific where necessary fruit development is in bottle is in it is explored so that sort of maturation you know what's happening to the wine and why we're going to get a little bit more focus on that and there's more emphasis on judging the quality of the wine and we can also as we taste um, we can link to the method of production and that's actively encouraged on the sat which i'll point out in a moment so hopefully all that makes sense and any questions that you have, please make sure they're going into the Q&A rather than in the chat box. All right. So when we think about quality now, we're going to also think about Blick, which we'll, you've probably heard before. You've probably heard it at level two, even though it's not something that you necessarily have to think about too much at level two. But definitely at level three, we must be thinking about Blick. And of course, we're thinking about bottle aging now. So Blick is balance length. So the length is the finish. 
Um, intensity, so intensity would be those identifiable characteristics as well. I, I think I for intensity, but I also for in ad ad identifiable characteristics. So when you're smelling a wine, an example would be you're smelling a wine and it's really clear what you're smelling. So like, oh my goodness, I'm really getting a very kind of tropical lychee, or maybe you're smelling it and you're getting really clear um, vanilla notes, or maybe you're getting um, apple skin. So things that you go, oh, it's not just, you know, an apple, I'm actually getting apple skin, or you're even, you know, you might even be thinking this feels like wild strawberry rather than just strawberry. And so when you get those very, very distinct, very identifiable, well-defined characteristics, that will, of course, lead to a high quality level. And again, if you're smelling a wine and it smells, oh, it's just fruity, so it's going to be more generic, then you know that is going to help you with your, your quality assessment. And of course, complexity as well. So complexity will usually be the number of clusters that you're going to find in the wine. And there also might be an element of uh, complexity um, that you could find structurally too. So then, um, so that's our blick, balance, length, intensity, slash identifiable characteristics and complexity. And then will this wine age in bottle? And we'll have a look at what you see on the SAT for that. So our systematic approach to tasting for level three, and that will address will the wine age in bottle? And we don't have to be able to see into the future. We just need to make some reasonable assessments about the wine to give us a kind of understanding of, of how that's going to work over time. OK, so here we go. I've set out all the marks now so you can see where they are available. So when you're assessing at level two, that was all very nice. Um, and you knew that at the end of the course, you're going to get your multiple choice um, questions and um, and hopefully you do well. And that's that. But uh, unfortunately, if you want to pass level three, you have to pass the level three tasting as well. But our students generally do pretty well um, and it is straightforward. It's systematic. So what I want to do is have a, have a little look at it and see where those marks lie and sort of how then you would approach your tasting. So. Um, we've got clarity. So clarity is a new thing that's come up, but I really wouldn't worry about that. Um, it's just to give us an idea that there are wines out there that aren't clear. So I think we can have an impression sometimes when we come into maybe level one and level two, you know, that maybe our wine tasting experience, particularly for those um, students who maybe aren't working in wine, um, is maybe not as wide. It depends. It's obviously from person to person. But if you've got a wine that is it, hazy, then... Um, you know, that's something that you can think about. It won't necessarily be falsy, hence the question mark there. Um, but clarity, if you're tasting at home, maybe, or you're tasting in, in a wine bar where they have less conventional wines, you know, that's something to think about. But in class and in an exam, you probably wouldn't get a wine like that. So there aren't any marks for that. OK, so we can think about the appearance and look at it and remark on the wines. But it doesn't necessarily always translate into marks. Where it does translate into marks will be the intensity. So there'll be the intensity and you'll be looking at the wine and judging the wine. And you do this differently for, for white, red and rosé. I and mean, if you've done level two, you will have done it already. But there's only one mark for intensity. And then for colour. So the colour, you can see it's slightly different because we've got salmon here for, for level three. And we didn't have that for, for level two. But we'll talk about that a little bit later. I've got a comparison to make a bit later. So you've got the colours. So you've got lemon green as well. So there's a couple other things. So what's really important is when you get to level three, you do familiarise yourself with your level three SAT rather than keep referring back to the level two one, if that's what you've got in your mind. Um, and then we've got other observations. Now, other observations, again, there's no mark for other observations. So there's a mark for intensity and a mark for colour. So two marks for appearance in total. Um, but where you've got sort of legs, tears, deposit, petions, bubbles, that's something you can write about because you're encouraged to notice things about the wines and remark on them, but you won't necessarily get marks. But it's good practice to be able to really think about the wines. If you've got a wine with pétillance, what does that mean, for example? The pétillance mean like a little bit of spritz. So we know that actually there's some regions in the world where you do get wines with a little bit of spritz. Um, and so we can think, OK, well, that actually helps with maybe identification or, um, you know, bubbles. Well, we'll be thinking about it as a sparkling wine. Um, potentially. So yeah, some other observations to think about. On the nose, so we've got two marks for appearance. On the nose, we have a total of seven marks and they're split like this. So again, condition, um, clean, unclean, faulty. Again, you're not going to have in, an, in a classroom environment or when you're buying wines for an online course, you're probably going to be buying wines that are clean. Um, and if they're faulty, that's I mean, an accident usually. It's, it's not something that you, uh, was, was it, was, that you meant to do because, of course, there are 
bottles out there that are faulty have cork taint, for example. But again, that's not going to be um, a mark um, because actually it would be assumed really if you are going to write an SAT for a wine on the specification at level three that it would be clean wine. So again, we'll have one mark for intensity. Now here we can see we've got um, a few more intensities. So we've got light, medium, minus, medium, medium plus pronounced. For level two, it was light, medium, pronounced. So the approach here would be that you say, okay, um, and we'll practice this in just a moment. Okay, um, I'm gonna smell the wine. And my at level three, I would say to myself, is it light, medium, or pronounced? Now, if it's light, it's light. If it's light at level two, it's light at level three. If it's pronounced, it's pronounced. So if it's pronounced at level two, it's pronounced at level three. Now, medium, if it's medium at level two, it could be medium minus, medium, or medium plus. So that's where you've got to, at level three, if you get something medium, you've got to think, okay, where am I? Am I closest to something at the lower end of the scale? So maybe, you know, this is lighter, or am I closest to something that's more intense? So more pronounced, so therefore, if it's bang in the middle, medium. If it's a little bit lighter, maybe we're medium minus. If it's going towards pronounced, but not quite there, medium plus. Um, so yes, and we've got our aroma characteristics. This time there are five marks. So you have to write at least five things, and these would be the descriptors. So you wouldn't be writing the name of the clusters. So if you wrote something like um, oak, yeast, red fruit, well, you probably wouldn't get yeast and red fruit together, but let's say oak, yeast, and um, green fruit, you'd get no marks because you have to use the specific um, characteristics. So um, if you, if, we'll have a look at SAT in a moment, um, where we've got the lexicon and you'll see that the lexicon has the cluster titles which are in bold and then um so you'll have for example stone fruit and then next to it you'll have the descriptors and they will be um not in bold and you'll have um things like peach apricot nectarine those are the characteristics if you get stone fruit in a wine you want to be saying peach or apricot or nectarine you don't want to write stone fruit if you if you just write stone fruit you won't get any marks so you must get so they have to come from those descriptors and then once you've, um, yeah, and then you need to make sure you've got at least five to get your marks. Now it might be that you smell something and you're like, I don't really, I'm really struggling to get five things. Well, probably the wine is then simple. So you need to write simple. So you must write simple on the nose. If you write simple on the nose, you've also got to write it on the palate. So you get simple, could be one of those marks. And then you could write, okay, it's a bit generic, not really getting very much. Maybe I'm getting some green fruit. So apple and pear, maybe I'm getting some citrus fruit, okay, lemon, lime, and then simple, and that's your five marks. However, if you were to have a wine, and the same applies to, to flavors to a point, except you can see flavors actually only have three marks if we have a look down, but I'll talk about that in a moment. If you were to smell a wine, and actually the wine does have primary and secondary and tertiary characteristics, you will need to write at least one thing from one of those areas. So if you were getting an older, um, let's say an older Oki Rioja, and you put some um, some fruit characteristics because of course they you know it's not it's not fully developed so it's got some fruit characteristics and then you would want there be some oak characteristics so there's so you'd be wanting to write maybe some red fruit and black fruit characteristics such as you know red cherry um, maybe a bit of black currant and then on the no and then on for secondary you'd be writing something on the lines of um, vanilla um, charred wood. Um, and then, because it has been aging for a while in bottle, you'd be writing some characteristics to reflect that. So like leather or earth. Now you probably write quite a few things because it's probably got quite a lot of complexity, but if you were to miss anything from secondary or you were to miss anything from tertiary or equally miss anything from primary, then you would miss a mark for each of those sections. So as long as you've got one thing for either primary, secondary or tertiary, where there are primary, secondary and tertiary characteristics, then you will, uh, you'll get your, your five, full five marks. Equally, there's some wines that are very complex, but they don't have secondary and tertiary characteristics. An example I think of often is something like a very, very complex Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc, because they do exist. And therefore you've got a whole range of flavors and aromas running from um, all the way from floral through to you've got green fruit, citrus fruit, um, stone fruit, tropical fruit. Um, you'll have potentially other characteristics as well so like wet stones um, and so they are going to find actually that you've got a lot of complexity but it's just coming from primary but that's fine because it's the number of clusters rather than um, than whether they all come from whether you've got a range through primary secondary and tertiary 
Of course, if you do have a range through primary, secondary and tertiary, you are more likely to have a complex wine, but that doesn't mean to say that that's the only way you can get complexity. Okay, um, so yeah, so you want at least five things potentially, you know, across primary, secondary and tertiary for aroma characteristics and development. So you'll be smelling a wine. If it's not showing any evidence of having aged in bottle, okay, um, then it's going to be youthful. Even if it might age later, if it hasn't, if it's got no tertiary, then it's youthful. If it's got some tertiary, but it's still got primary, then it's developing because it's aging and maybe it can continue to age. Um, if it's only smelling of tertiary character, well, there's no primary, basically. If there's no primary, then it's fully, <coughs> <coughs> fully developed. Um, tired and past its best aren't really descriptors that we ever tend to use because it's very rare that you'll get a tired or past its best, but it will probably therefore be absolutely no primary. And really, um, it's it, the, there's not really the, the harmony of flavours and, and aromas there, um, and it will seem a little bit past it. But um, that's not really one to worry about. Really, when we're tasting at level three, we're either tasting wines that are youthful or developing. So going through the palette, very, very similar to level two, um, except we've just got those um, more, more range there because we've got the five point scales rather than the three point scales in, um, in many respects. And so we've got, um, you know, dry through to luscious for sweetness. So luscious being very, very, very sweet. So something like a PX Sherry, um, and there's one mark for that. Um, acidity, again, if it was low acidity previously at level two, it's still gonna be low acidity. If it's high acidity level two, it's still gonna be high acidity um, at level three, but one mark assigned for that. Tannins, okay, so again, similar, except it's a five point scale. Alcohol step is a three point scale. Um, and at fortified wines, of course, it has to be different because our three point scale of uh, alcohol ranges. So we've got a range of low is anything up to 11% um, alcohol. And then medium will be um, 11 to 13.9% alcohol. And then high is 14% and above. So that's for most wines. But of course, when you get to fortified wines, they are um, all high. So they've got a separate scale for that, but you're not gonna be assessed. So you can think about it when you're doing a fortified wine session, but you may not need to worry about it outside of that session. And um, as far as I'm aware, when we get to um, alcohol at fortified level, then we're talking 15 to 16.4 below, 16 and a half to 18.4 for medium. And um, yeah, yep, yeah, 18.5 above is high. So then body, there'll be one, one mark applying for that. And we've got another five point scale here. Um, mousse, so when, when you're tasting your, your sparkling wines is only, um, only useful um, for, wet, for that. But again, you don't get a mark for this. So you don't have to write about the mousse. You can talk about whether it's delicate, creamy or aggressive. Um, flavor intensity, we're going, um, yeah, again, five point scale. And then our flavor characteristics. Well, you know, we'll think about maybe what you've got for your aromas, see if that's similar on the palate. And then you'll make sure you've got at least three, again, covering if you need to cover primary, secondary and tertiary. OK, and then the finish, a five point scale as well. And we're looking at it um, yeah, the same way. Now, finish is important because we need to think about that when it comes to our um, our complexity. So we've got our conclusions now. So there's only two marks, um, but I'll talk about that. That a little bit in a moment and because we do our current are encouraged as you taste to think about quality quite a lot even though there's only two marks available for quality and including the suitability for bottle aging for our conclusions actually the amount we think about it and talk about it in the class maybe it, that's not representative of the marks that you'd get in the in the assessment but then of course you know it's uh, sometimes it can be tricky to work out the, the quality and the and the um, and the potential for aging. So maybe it's a good thing that there aren't too many marks um, assigned to this area. But yeah, so quality we've got faulty, poor, acceptable, good, very good, outstanding. Um, usually we start at acceptable because poor wines. There are very few of them about. They're definitely not selected um, for on the, on the wine lists for your for the teaching wines. And faulty, well, it's faulty and it wouldn't ever be assessed. Um, you can taste them and try them and you know so when you're in a restaurant you can recognize them maybe a bit more easily but um no it's, it's not necessary to, to taste faulty wines for the course 
So really we split it into acceptable good, very good and outstanding. There'll be one mark for that. And we'll reach that mark by going through Blick. So balance, length, intensity, slash identifiable characteristics and complexity. And then we'll kind of, it depends, but generally you, you're gonna think, okay, is this, does it have these things? Does it have balance? If it has balance, then it's going to be, and nothing else, it's going to be at least acceptable. If it's got balance, then, you know, maybe one other thing or a couple of, you know, combination. So it's balanced, it's got a bit of complexity, it's got a medium finish, um, but maybe, you know, it's not that well defined the characteristics or the other way around, maybe there is some definition, but it's not that complex. And maybe we're looking at something that's good. And then something that kind of has, you know, three things across the board clearly, um, or a combination. So we've got, yes, it's definitely got um, balance. Um, the length is, is pretty long, maybe it's medium plus. We've got quite a bit of complexity. Um, there's good definition. Maybe we're looking at something that's very good. And then once everything is kind of, yes, 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 we've got balance here. We've got long length. We've got great intensity and, ident and identifiable characteristics. And we've got lots of complexity. You know, tick all of those. Then we've got an outstanding wine. Okay, so that's kind of how you reach, kind of best fit, how you reach your quality level. I think a lot of you would have done that at level two anyway. And then the level of redness for drinking. So generally, we don't have to worry about too young. We don't have to worry about too old. It's more about, can you drink it now um, and has potential for aging? Or can you drink it now, but it's, um, but it's not suitable. To, so you must drink it now, but it's not suitable um, for aging or further aging. So... Um, it's quite straightforward, really. If you're tasting it and it's generally quite a youthful wine that's probably not that complex uh, and probably not got lots of concentration, it's much more likely to be a drink now, um, not suitable for, for aging. Maybe it's fully developed, in which case it's not suitable for further aging. Um, or maybe you're drinking it and you're thinking, oh, there's a little bit of, of um, tertiary here and it's got a lot going on, it's got concentration. So yeah, it's, this wine will age. So that's something that you'll learn about when you're in the classroom, but it's definitely a new thing to think about. And you don't have to be like, you know, Nostradamus and looking into the future. Things on your tasting note will tell you like acid, level of acid, the level of tannins, you know, potentially complexity. Things like that will push you towards a sensible conclusion for the level of readiness for drinking and potential for aging. So, yeah, so you can see it's 20 or 21 marks available depending on whether your wine, if it's a white wine, we won't be thinking about tannins, or for a rosé, we won't think about tannins. Um, and if it's a red wine, of course, there'll be that extra mark for tannins. And then, um, you know, depending on how many of those marks you get in your exam, that will relate to whether you get a pass rate, you know, a merit or a distinction. Okay, so, <coughs> excuse me again. Um, you can see here that we've got um, the lexicon, which is much wider now. Um, and actually what, what strikes me when I look at the lexicon um, for um, level three is we've got questions at the side. So they're there to make you think about the wine, the style and the quality and being able to get to your conclusions and also just have a deeper understanding of what's in the glass. So here we go. Are the flavors delicate or intense, simple or complex? They do need to mention simple if they are. Generic or well-defined. Again, you can write these things down in your tasting note. You don't just have to think about them. You can write them down as well fresh or cooked, underripe or ripe or overripe, because all of these things, particularly you know, when you think about ripeness of the fruit, you know, ripeness of the fruit might tell us where, what kind of climate we're in. Um, generic or well-defined will kind of tell us about the quality of the wine. Um, delicate or intense, again, the style of the wine. So we're always thinking price, quality, style, and we can link that in our tasting. And you're being asked these relevant questions as you taste through. When we get to secondary, you can see we've got another set of questions here and you see we've got far more um, choices for um, to, to pick up from as well. And so we've got all the flavours from yeast, malolactic conversion or oak, you know. And so if they are from yeast or malolactic conversion or oak, what's that telling us about the wine? What's that telling us about the winemaking and the methods of production? Because we can be linking again back to methods of production here. And so our theory can inform our tasting and our tasting um, can help us think about the theory as well. And then we've got um, slightly different now because we've actually split up tertiary characteristics into deliberate oxidation. So that's first at the top now, whereas that was the bottom. And now you can see that we're looking at fruit development. So that's something that we haven't really thought about before. So fruit development, and that can be in bottle. Um, 
and we've got it split into white wine and red wine. We've got bottle age. So when you leave a wine bottle for a very long period of time, these characteristics are going to appear. So for red and also for white as well. So we've got more to think about when it comes to, you know, post winemaking um, for a bottle. And we're here now, we want to smell and taste our wine and think to us, OK, not think about it's not just now about what am I smelling and tasting. It's about what am I smelling, tasting and why? Why am I smelling hazelnut in this wine? Ah, OK, maybe that's because it's undergone oxidation. OK, is that is that a style of wine? You know, what what, do, what does this mean for the wine? Um, equally, you know, ah, I'm smelling things like petrol, um, cinnamon, um, nuttiness. Maybe this is, you know, this is telling me this wine has been aging in bottle. OK, and so therefore this is a wine that's designed to age in bottle. And you can really think about why that is. Is it, is it certain grape varieties that do that? Is it certain regions? Is it, is, it, is it because this comes from a particular part of the world where, you know, this has a, um, this is a, a unique style of wine and why is that? And there's lots of questions to ask, aren't there, when you're tasting a wine. And at level three, that's what we really do. Whereas at level two, it's more just about, okay, yeah, I can smell this and this and that could probably tell me a little bit about climate. <coughs> and potentially, you know, we do a little bit of identification um, and, and, and a little bit of reasoning, but here a lot more linking and a lot more explanation. Okay, so what I want us to do now is I want us to think about, so I want to, we'll, we'll watch this and I'll kind of note, make a few notes of things, but we've got an SAT for level two and we've got blank SAT here for level three. And this SAT here is an SAT that we would be using for a premier cru Chablis. So, um, and I've got the lexicon on the next slide as well. So if we have a look at that and we can translate it and see how that would work if in, in class or when you're online doing your activities and you're tasting a level um, at level two and you're tasting a Chablis, a premier cru Chablis, how is that gonna differ from when you're tasting it at level three. So we can see here that we'd get, well, we'd get marks potentially if this were be, to be um, an assessed tasting. But apart from that, okay, at level three, apart from that, so at level two, pale lemon, okay, I think we could eat, that would be the same. Okay, so there's not too much difference there. Pale lemon, right, on the nose, okay. So we don't have to worry again about clarity or condition, um, but they're there just to have a little think. So we're thinking more about the wine um, this time. So um, intensity, so um, now we've got light, medium minus, medium, medium plus pronounced. Now for this wine, for a Premier Cru Chablis, sometimes they can be medium plus. So it might now be need to actually put this into medium plus for intensity. For aroma characteristics, okay, <coughs> we need to find at least five. So for a wine like this, you'd be thinking, well, actually we've got it on the next slide, but it'd, it'd be a range of primary, and there's a range of secondary, and we'll look at what they are in just a moment. Um, now, development. So if we haven't got any tertiary characteristics on this wine, which we'll see in a moment we don't, um, then this would be have to be highlighted as a youthful wine. Because at the moment, let's say it's a younger vintage, something like 2020, 2021, you're probably not going to, mostly on the, on the shelves now, probably the, uh, the youngest one you'll be getting would be around 2020. It's not going to be showing tertiary characteristics um, at this point, so it would be youthful. Um, so on the palate, um, well, dry would stay stay the same. The acidity would stay the same. It would be high. Um, no tannins. It's a white wine. The alcohol, well, if it's medium at level two, it's medium at level three. The body, so medium bodied at level two, probably for a Chablis, probably is around medium as well. Um, less less likely to be medium plus. Um, probably a bit more substantial than medium minus. So probably similar there, but bear in mind, of course, where we've got medium, we have to think about it a bit more at level three. Um, flavor intensity, pronounced, it's pronounced at level, um, yeah, so it's clearly more going on on the, on the palate here than there is on the nose for this one. I do find that with Chablis, I don't know about, about your experience, but yeah, so flavor intensity, if it's pronounced at level two, it's also pronounced at, uh, um, at, at level three and it probably means that at level two for the intensity on the nose it was more like medium maybe it's more like medium plus there and then it's just gone up a little bit on the palate because of the acidity and and other elements bringing out character characteristics <coughs> um, and then we've got um, a finish long it's going to be long again um, and here we need to make sure we've written three flavors aromas at least 
and we'll look at those in just a moment. So quality here, very good. Well, it's going to be the same quality level um, at level two as at level three, but now we will have justified it more. So what is it that it's not got? Because it's not outstanding. So what's it lacking? Well, here I would say it's probably complexity and we'll look at that on the next slide. Um, and then we've got to talk about potential for ageing. Um, and here, you know, I think we can make an argument that it is a wine that could age, maybe because of the acidity, because of um, because of fruit concentration. Um, but then again, you know, if I think if this was a, a, a general Chablis, probably would argue that it's more about being sort of fresh and fruity. Um, OK, so. Um, Oh, right. I can see that something said um, it's saying that my um, only slide nine is being shown. I'm on slide 10. I don't know if um, uh, there seems to be a technical issue. It's saying that I might stop and start sharing again. Sorry, I'll stop sharing and I will share again. See if that works. OK. Um. And go through. Right, can you see slide 10 now? Okay, good. <laughs> I don't know what happened there. Apologies. So I've been talking about a lot of stuff and no one knows what I was talking about. So I'll quickly um, go, go through that. I don't know, just, I just suddenly saw it said my screen sharing had paused, bizarrely. Um, okay, so. As you can see, so everything I was talking about before, um, we had, um, so I'll, I'll very, very briefly go through, the, through it again. So um, we can translate the appearance exactly the same, okay? So I've got pale lemon for level two, pale lemon for level three. For nose, medium intensity here, but actually it could well be medium plus at level three. Aroma characteristics, we need to make sure we have at least five written down um, from the relevant um, areas so that would be primary and secondary and they'd have to be included and we'll see that on the next slide and hopefully you'll all see that and then um, we've got um, on the palette so we've got um, dry so we'll say that we we'll say the same so dry the sweetness on both um, acidity high for both because we're not in medium medium so premier cru chablis is always going to have high acidity it doesn't matter whether you're assessing it at level one level two level three a diploma it's going to be high okay no tannins in this one it's a white wine Alcohol is medium, that will stay the same. Okay, so it's in that in that same range, and that's regardless. Um, because it's three point point scale for both. Body, so body here, I would say most Premier Cru Chablis is, is around medium bodied anyway. So I don't think we need to move from where we are, but bear in mind, obviously, we've got a five point scale, so you could move up or down. Um, and then um, we've got flavor intensity. Um, pronounced so that would stay the same and I can see that it's gone up a little bit from the nose so like I think I mentioned before um tends to be a bit more expressive on the palate and the acidity can help bring out the characteristics there as well finish is long here for level two so finish will be long for level three um and then um so quality um would be well it's very good um so it's be very good at level um at level three as well but we'd have to justify that and I mentioned why that was before and it would really probably be here due to um, not being maybe complex enough um, to be um, to be outstanding so um, potential for aging I mentioned that this is a premier crew so it could well have a little bit of potential for aging um, whereas maybe your general Chablis or your petty Chablis um, will probably lack the concentration um, to to age particularly okay so that's our um, systematic approach to tasting wine and that's looking at the structure so the appearance nose and palette and conclusions um so i'm going to click on the next slide and i hope everyone can see that okay i'm just checking the chat now <laughs> just to make sure um yes okay we've got some thumbs up perfect right so um here we can see i've, I've noted down some of the characteristics the flavors and aromas you'd expect to find for chablis um and they would be mainly green fruit citrus fruit there's an element of stone fruit on this little element of melon this particular one and um, i've taken a tasting note from um, and then we've got wet stone which kind of translates into that mineral quality um, and then we've got some yeast and some malolactic conversion so biscuit and cream so now yes we'd have the same thing we translate the same thing onto um onto our, our taste use the same lexicon really <coughs> but now i'd be thinking about okay maybe 
actually, I think more about the fruit ripeness. Um, so, um, and it's, it's on here actually, so I could have put sort of, it's not unripe, it's ripe fruit, but I might, might note this down at level three um, a bit more. Um, and maybe think about the, 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 um, the flavours maybe being a bit delicate, um, potentially as well. So you can just start describing them. And then for secondary, I'll be thinking, OK, well, I've got yeast here. So where's that actually coming from? Um, well, I think that's coming from the lees. OK, so maybe actually that's why the body is, is medium as well. So we've got some texture and we've got some flavours and aromas from the leaves. And we're going to think about that a little bit more in winemaking. And then we've got um, malolactic conversion. So hang on a minute, why would you do malolactic conversion? And what do you get from that? Well, you get <coughs> the creamy buttery notes, but we've got, um, we're using malolactic conversion here because the acidity is very high. And then we think, okay, well, where is this wine from? It's from Burgundy. Malolactic conversion is something that happens in Burgundy a lot. And so now we're kind of, really thinking about what's what's happening what's happening what's the climate what's the wine making it's premier crew it's premier crew so what do we expect from premier crew well premier crew we kind of expect um we do expect a bit more body a bit more complexity um so why is this not grand crew well it's not grand crew because if we know about wine making practice in chablis and grand crew grand crew would have some oak and that would be with so we've been noting that down um so yeah so you know are now thinking about okay well, we've got, it's got sort of fresh fruit characteristics. We are, um, so we, and we've got high acidity, so probably in a cool climate, so that'll make sense. And then winemaking, where well, we've got lees, we've got malolactic. What's, where in the world do you kind of do that kind of thing? Um, well, burgundy, and then, you know, but we haven't got oak in this wine, but we've got very sort of fresh fruit characteristics. So I think, well, this is very typical then of Chablis potentially. And what's the difference between a Chablis, AOC, a, a Premier Cru Chablis and a Grand Cru Chablis? And so you can be really delving into methods of production, linking it to climates, linking it to, to regions and specific winemaking practices. So there's lots and lots of things to think about when you're, so it might look on the surface, oh yes, I'm writing the same things, but actually, you're thinking about it in a slightly different way and you're feeling like you understand the wine more. Okay, so we're going to do a very brief comparison now and hopefully you can all see slide 12 now. I don't really know what happened earlier. So um, <coughs> let me know if you can't. I think I've got a thumbs up for that, so that's good. Okay, so now White's in Fandel. So White's in Fandel is a rosé wine. Um, and we'll have a look a little bit across here because again, wine making is really interesting for this wine. So we've got um, we've got medium um, intensity, so that would be the same. We've got pink orange. Now pink orange. Now we're going to use salmon at level three. It's you know to be honest, pink orange sort of came after salmon. So um, salmon. So pink orange would have been salmon in the past. But really, when we say salmon, what we mean is it's a bit pinky. It's a bit orangey. It's not distinctively pink. It's not distinctively orange. It's kind of in the middle. And then intensity on the nose medium for level two i would say for this kind of wine it's probably around medium um at level three and maybe medium minus and aroma characteristics are all primary now we'll talk about what we would describe the aroma characteristics at just a, on, in a minute but we've got sweetness now now you can see that for sweetness we've got a wider range and sweetness here we've got drop for level two dry off dry medium and sweet well, for, for, for level three, we've got dry, off dry, medium dry, medium sweet, sweet and luscious. So it's quite a different scale. Now, this wine is medium at level two. So it's either going to be medium dry or medium sweet at level three. Um, and again, it's a perception thing. Um, but it's probably around medium, medium dry. Um, it depends because some some white zempadels have more or less sugar um, than others. But again, you're going to have to now decide, is it? At the drier end of medium or the sweeter end of medium so it depends on on the on the style you have there um the acidity medium but probably for this wine i'd i'd go on the palate medium plus actually because usually they do have a bit of freshness to them but they're not quite as high as say something like a, a chablis so we'd be moving up we'd have to be a little bit more specific there um no tannins it's a rosé and then alcohol is low because these are usually below 11%. So now we're going to think about winemaking. Why is it low? Why is the alcohol low in this wine? And think and, and go through the method of production. So we'd be thinking about the winemaking as we taste this wine quite a lot. 
Um, the body is light, we've got lower alcohol, it's not concentrated. Um, so that would stay the same. Flavor intensity, medium, that would probably stay the same. And then flavor characteristics are all primary and you need to have at least three of them. <coughs> On the next slide, I'll talk about the kind of words we would use to describe this wine. And the finish is a short finish, so that would stay the same. So quality level, well, we're probably going to find that this quality level is the same because that's, uh, you know, once it's acceptable, it's acceptable across the board. And um, we'll think about why it's acceptable. Um, in, and, um, and that would be now, well, is it in balance? Yes, it probably is in balance with, you know, the medium plus acidity It's probably balancing the sugar well. Um, the length, though, is short. The identifiable characteristics, well, a word I would probably use to describe characteristics from white Zinfandel would probably be generic and, con and confected. So those aren't generally words that are very positive when it comes to describing the, identi like the, um, the definition of flavours and aromas. And complexity, well, we'll have a look at a moment. We'll see that there's only a very small range of characteristics, really, that you find in this wine. So if it is a youthful wine, it's not that concentrated, um, and it's really known for its fruity, youthful quality, then it's a wine that would be um, not potential, would not have potential for aging. So you just say, drink now, not suitable for aging. Right, so here we go. So you can see there's a few things, but bear in mind that really, they're mostly just red fruit characteristics. There's a hint maybe of melon, hint of blossom. Um, and these are not just really describing any extra characteristics in the wine. We're saying that the fruit is ripe um, and there's a candied note to it, so confected. So really, I mean, what, couple of clusters? So that's not a complex wine. So that's, and then I would be adding here for this because it's not that they're written on the SAT, but I would add simple for this. And for level three, you'd have to, to get your marks. So you'd add simple. I think you could even use the word generic. And that's where you get your marks from. So you could write some, and they'd all be primary. So you'd have maybe some red fruit characteristics, potentially blossom or melon. Um, you might describe the wine as confected or simple. As long as you've got five things written down, and one of them is simple, then you'll get your five marks. And they can all be from primary because this doesn't have any secondary or tertiary characteristics. Okay, so hopefully that's kind of shown you that there is a difference in how you approach tasting the wines. Of course, there's quite a few similarities from level two, but a lot more thinking and linking um, and analysis of the wine goes on at level three. And of course, we're encouraged to think about the methods of production. We're encouraged to think about the, um, the aging ability and in more depth, the quality of the wine as well. So um, I am here to answer some questions that you have. So I see we've got quite a few questions um, on in the Q&A. And um, OK, so I'll, I'll try and answer these verbally live. So anyone who's watching um, on, for, on YouTube will, will be able to get the benefit of this. So um, most famous white wine from Italy. I don't I think mean, there's a lot of famous white wines from Italy. So um, I'll leave that for you to find out. Um, OK, and any, Q, any questions you have, please put them in the Q&A rather than in the chat box. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I'm not, not really here to answer about famous wines in the world, um, but, uh, we, you know, Pinot Grigio, maybe <laughs> that's rather a famous white wine from, uh, from Italy. Um, so the assessed tasting is written response, not verbal observations. Absolutely, Paul. So you'll be writing a tasting note. You'll be given an, an answer sheet for the exam. But as you go through the course, you've got a booklet where you can write all your art. A bit like for level two, you've got places to write your um, your tasting notes. And so when you actually do your exam, yeah, it's all written down. Um, and, and it will be um, assessed as such. So I hope that answers your question. So um, in class, of course, you could talk about wines and with friends and, um, and maybe colleagues or whoever you're doing tastings with and practice with, you would hopefully talk about the wines, but um, for the final assessment, it is written. Okay, if you're one level off on the assessment, for example, say medium acidity, although the wine is medium plus acidity, would you still get a mark for this or do you have to be spot on for the exam? Well, that's a very good question, Wolfgang. And the answer to that is, it depends. So if you're, if the marker feels that there is a little bit of ambiguity, so let's say you've got a wine and, you know, you're assessing it, maybe there's a few people assessing it and some think, oh, this is medium plus and some people think it's high um, or like in your example, you know, for some it's medium, for some it's medium plus, then, um, and, and it's a little bit ambiguous, it's not, it's not entirely certain, then usually what will happen is the marker will accept both of those answers, but you can only write one of them. Okay, so you don't need to worry too much 
um, if if it is if it's medium plus but you put medium but the marker thinks it could be interpreted as medium then the mark would be available for that but that won't happen all the time because some some wines they will just be a specific level now yes if you if you miss that then you will lose a mark there and you won't gain that mark okay um do you recommend to use wine aroma kits to train the nose the nose van etc well that's up to you i would say that probably more accurate to just to taste the smell and taste the actual things um, that they have in the Nadi van. So, for example, it's probably cheaper to buy an apple and um, some of the spices that they actually have, and then you can use them than um, buying the aroma kits. I have bought those aroma kits before, and the issue is that if you get the lids confused and they, yeah, then some of them are a little bit synthetic. You know, it depends. I think some people find them useful, but um, I don't think you need them. Let's put it that way. And they are quite pricey. Okay. Um, okay, so the, no, the tannin mark does not apply to white wines. No, and I know there are some skin contact white wines out there, but that's not going to be something that we focus on um, at level three. Okay, um, what's the best way to prepare for the level three exam, e.g. tasting and getting the right answer? And what's the passing rate of level three? Well, you may have noticed that actually there's no question about identification. So you don't need to worry about identifying the wine um, correctly. You just need to assess what's in the glass. So the best thing to do is to just taste and practice writing tasting notes. And in fact, from your theory and what you learn about um, online or in class, you could write dry tasting notes even. So if you know what, you could have a, have a go at, let's say, pick out a, a classic wine um, and, and write a tasting note um, and, and, and kind of have a look at your, in your book and see if that sort of describes the wine accurately. Um, so there's no kind of, when you say right answer, I guess what you mean, are you assessing the wine correctly? Well, to be honest, that does take practice, but you can practice it, um, not just tasting, but also writing dry notes as well. So that's when you're you know, writing generally about a wine um, without tasting it, but having it, you know, and then looking at the theory behind that. Um, but it's always great if you can get into, into tasting groups as well to practice. <coughs> so what is meant by fruit development compared to bottle age? So I suppose it's a similar thing, really, Delphine, that the fruit evolves over time. Um, and so, but other things happen in the bottle too. So for example, for a Riesling, let's say, that's aging for a long time, the fruit would might change to be more dried fruit. So you might get citrus turns into more citrus peel. But then other things like bottle age will be, you get that kind of petrol note and maybe a honeyed and, and note and smoky notes. So they're just slightly different. One is focusing on what happens to the fruit evolution and the other is other things that tend to happen. Okay, um, so hi Shreen. Um, so not a question on the SAT, but a few questions on the wine tasting. Is there any way to improve our perception of the wine by eating or not eating before? Okay, so eating or not eating before, um, you want a neutral palate when you're tasting. So, you know, often bread or crackers or water can help with that. Um, because bear in mind, of course, as soon as you have something on the palate, you've changed what's going on in, in your mouth. And when you taste something after that, it's going to affect it. So a neutral palate is, is a good idea. So don't be having strong coffees before you taste. Um, how long do you keep the wine in your mouth to maximise the quality of the wine tasting? Well, you keep in a few seconds, swoosh it around, lots of swooshing so it covers, you know, your tongue, your side of your cheeks, um, get it on your gums for tannins and stuff like that. Um, is there a way to enhance your olfactory receptors to better detect subtle aromas? Just practice, really. The more you practice, and the more you discuss wines with people, the more you'll become in tune to what's in the glass. Also, you do need to experience the things on the lexicon. So if you're looking through that lexicon and you think, oh, I don't really eat much red fruit, maybe now is the time to start tasting and eating it so that you're very aware of when you smell it and taste it in, in, in a glass. OK, so you need to know what those characteristics smell and taste like already. You need to be prepared for them to be in the wine, to so have them ready in your mind or have the SAT with you if you're not being assessed at that time, ready to recognise them. And then just practice. And the more you practice, the more you will pick up things. And always good to have conversations around the wines where you can. I hope that helps. OK, um, in level three, are students expected um, to remember everything from level two? Um, you, it's a good idea if you remember stuff, but it is because generally it is advised to do level two before you do level three. Um, because if you do level three without doing level two, we well, have to do a test. Um, but most most APPs require you to be very well versed in grape varieties and regions um, before you can do level three. So 
I would say read your level two book if you've if you've done level two first. Um, and you know there are lots of apps with flashcards and things like that. Um, so you can um, you can like access those to maybe remind yourself. So I think yes, if you do need to have a good understanding of grape varieties and regions um, and some winemaking methods before you embark on level three, you wouldn't want to go into level three um, not being prepared because there's a lot. It's a big jump between level two and level three. And if you have the opportunity, what I would do is if you get the book before you start the course is to read the book before you start the course. Read it before, read it during, read it after. Okay, more for theory though, really, for, uh, for tasting. Um, what mark needed to pass the assessed tasting? If you fail it, do you need to do the reading, the whole exam with theory, et cetera, too? Good question, Tom. So you need 55% to pass, um, and you need, if you fail, let's say you fail theory, but you pass tasting, then you only have to do tasting again. So you'll have to talk to your provider and find dates when you can come back and you'll, there'll be a fee to, to, to buy, to, to register for the exam. Um, but yeah, if you fail one and pass the other, then you've got that one in the bag. You don't need to worry. The one you've passed, you've done. You need to focus on the next bit. And so yeah, 55% is the, is the pass mark for both tasting and theory. And how long do you have at the tasting exam to assess one wine? Good question, um, Tatsuya. You've got 15 minutes, 15 minutes per wine. So 15 minutes to, to um, so half an hour in total. So best to share it across the two wines. There we go. If you do WSET online, do you buy your own wines to taste while on Zoom? So different APPs, different providers will do it differently. Often it's a series of online activities um, rather than Zoom calls, and you'll be given a prescribed list of wines to taste for that particular week. So yes, you, you do need to buy the wines yourself, um, and so you'll need to source them. And obviously, you know, it's it's easier maybe if you've got more access, depending on where you are in the world, what your job is. Um, but do look out for places that do pre-bottled samples um, and also half bottles as well, um, because um, there's quite a few um, distributors who, who do that. Also, you don't need to have tasted every wine in the world. Um, you just need to be able to assess what's in your glass. As long as you can calibrate well, don't feel that you need to taste absolutely every wine out there to feel confident. As long as you can calibrate what you've got, so you, you can tell, tell the difference between levels of acidity, levels of tannins, for example, you've got good, um, good understanding of the kind of range of aromas and flavors, then you, know, you, you don't need to have tasted everything because it's not an identification um, assessment. Okay, so Catherine, I find it difficult to name the flavours I get in wine and would like to develop my sense of smell and ability to know what is what. Do you have a tip on how to do that? I think what I've said before, just make sure you're familiar with those things around you. Um, so when you look at the wine, the level three lexicon, you can go, okay, and this is available on the website, so you can download it at any time. You don't need to be on the course to do that. So um, you can just, so you know all those things, then you just practice smelling them, then you practice smelling wine and thinking about the, what you've got in the wine. So it's practice. Nobody comes into wine with a naturally really great um, sense of, of smell, if you like. So I think there's a bit of a myth out there that some people are better tasters than others. I mean, it's, it's, it's experience and practice. I know over the time that I've been doing wine, it's, it's gone up. I've, I've got, I get better and better all the time. OK, so I'm still still getting better. <coughs> so there's no real you know, practice, familiarisation of aromas and flavours. Is there any negative marking? No, there's no real, yes and no. Okay, um, it's very rare that your marks would be capped. Okay, and they cap the mark. So it's not, so you don't, you don't, what will happen, and this is the only instance that this really happens, is if you're writing um, flavors and aromas that are completely wrong and do not refer to that wine at all, then they'll say, okay, well, this person cannot get the full five marks for aroma. So let's say you've got a Sauvignon Blanc, um, from New Zealand, and you start writing secondary character, loads of secondary characteristics. Maybe you're writing red fruit aromas. You know things that are so obviously wrong. They'll say, "Well, there's no way." Even though they've put five primary characteristics there that can relate to Sauvignon Blanc, they've added so many other things that don't describe that wine. There's no way we can give them five marks for this. So even though they've got, they would have five marks if they hadn't written the other things that are, don't relate. We can only give them four marks. So that kind of thing. So you get your marks capped. But honestly, you have to be really sort of kind of off-piste with the wine. So really not understanding the wine. 
to, to get to get there. So um, yeah, you're not going to get lots. You should be negatively marked too much. Where you get things wrong for, you know, um, the appearance, maybe the um, other structural elements, the quality. You just don't get the mark that you would have got if you got it right. Um, okay, if you've got 41 during the exam, you just won't you won't get a 41 in the exam because the wine will be will have been assessed by the educator, and they will if it's faulty when they assess it, they'll change it. The wine that isn't faulty, so you'll get a different wine. Okay, um, aging potential isn't all wine for drinking now, or producer wouldn't have bottled it. Um, okay, so yes, you can age wine, but yeah, does it age positively? Um, so yes, a lot of wines, to be honest, ninety-five percent of wines out there are to be drunk in their youth, um, but there are wines out there that you need to age. So, for example, something like a very high quality left bank Bordeaux, with right bank Bordeaux, which um, <coughs> when a red wine in its youth, the tannins will be too high, the oak will be not fully integrated. So um, not all wine is for drinking now. Or something like a Barolo, young Barolo, very, very high tannins. Um, but then, yes, yeah, so lots of wines that will get tired quite quickly. So, um, so some wines, you might have an answer where it could be maybe yes and no. So there are positives about it being young and there's positives about it aging. And maybe that's preferential you know, it's personal preference. And so you would be able to answer either and, and get the mark. Um, but there's some that definitely, they're not gonna age and some that definitely they um, will age. So yeah, you can have a big conversation about that, but uh, generally you've got to kind of come down, usually come down on one or the other and have a good idea why that is. Okay, um, so Mark of Mexico, which countries are new producers of quality wine in recent years? Which are their flagship grapes and which, no, and the, right, this is, I'm afraid this is something that you'd have to look at in the specification um, because that's a big, big question there. So if you want to know what wines are on the course, you can download the level three specification. I think that's, uh, um, that's the key thing. Um, and um, yeah, I'm afraid I'm not going to have time to answer all of that right now. Sorry, Marco. Okay, it says in the Chablis, coming on Premier Cru versus the uh, um, Appellation. This seems like a jump to being able to know the region the wine comes from. That's the winemaking process. Does this mean we know what the wine is that's being assessed? So in class, you will know what the wine is that's being assessed most of the time. They're not going to be blind wines, um, very rarely. And, in, and um, you know, when you're writing your tasting notes, you're going to, while you're doing the course, you're going to know what's in the glass. So um, you will know what the wine is when being assessed. So therefore, most of the time, so therefore you can talk about that. OK, you know, blind tasting is just a part of the assessment at the end. Um, really, we're learning and we're learning about the wine. So it would be kind of not very helpful to show most of the wines blind. Um, and of course, when we look, when you read the book, there's a lot of theory there. And that theory, like the region and winemaking in certain regions, you can apply to the tasting. Um, what's the difference between French Syrah and Australian Syrah, Shiraz? Well, you should know that from level two. Um, we've got different climates and different winemaking. Um, and that's something that you'll explore when you get. So I think, I think this is quite the right forum for that right now. Um, but uh, there are differences and that's often to do with climate and winemaking. And that, that's something that, uh, um, that you will find out on the courses. Okay, um, if you took the level two in 2018, is there some theory updated that I should learn before starting level three? Um, to be honest, you'd be fine to go straight into, into level three. Um, it's not, not drastically long ago that you did it. I would argue that if you've done it quite a long time, you know, if you've done it like over 10 years ago, maybe a good idea um, to get in touch and, and maybe see if there's any materials or, or look at the specification, probably a good idea. Yes, I think the events team have put up to look at the specification. Um, but 2018, I don't think we've had anything change too dramatically. There's been a few little tweaks, but yeah, look at the specification. Okay. Um, what is the future climate based on the present situation of Bordeaux climate? What will be wine harmonies? Oh my goodness, me, that is a question that I could write, you know, a 10,000 word essay on. So I think probably we'll leave that for now, but definitely climate is important. And, uh, you know, just for your own personal um, studies, you can be thinking about climate change in different varieties around the world, because that is quite exciting. <laughs> Maybe a little bit worrying, but definitely a fascinating topic. Okay. And shrink, can you smell umami in a wine? Umami is a taste. So no would be the, 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 the short answer to that. So there we go. If anyone's got any further questions, I've um, hopefully answered all the ones. Um, so, oh, so I've got a few, got something here from Vince team. 
Um, are we allowed to have the lexicon sheet with us in the exam? No, you're not. So that SAT that you see all there, um, that, that those green sheets, um, no, you need to learn them off by heart. And um, so you will not be allowed those in the exam, but very, uh, um, a very good uh, question there. Um, so yes, I think, um, let me just see. I think I've answered all your questions. I'll keep looking to see if there's any more. I think that's it, I'll go back. Um, yep, yeah, so thank you very much for um, for your um, participation. And um, yeah, I hope I hope it was useful. Um, I hope it was enjoyable, a good a good start to the week. And we, we look forward to to seeing you um, if and, and hearing from you if you do decide to uh, to embark on your level three. Checking. I've done that one. Oh, here we go. Um, in general, how should we allocate study time for each examination for criteria? <coughs> Again, that can be found in the specification. So have a look there. Um, probably you'll need to spend more time on the theory element because there's a big book to learn. Okay. Thank you.